Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the Fault to Shah learning series. I'm particularly uh, grateful and excited um, to have Professor Alice Gabriel with us today. Um, Alice um, is going to talk to us about physics-based earthquake modelling and seismic hazard assessment. She works at the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at LMU Munich, where she leads the earthquake physics group. Um, here they're trying to really understand the fundamentals of what going on in, in great detail about earthquakes while they're occurring and she gets to have a lot of fun with supercomputers in the process. Um, Alice has a lot of accolades to her name um, as well as being widely cited in the community with over 1,200 citations and an H index of 18. She has a lot of awards. Um, just in 2020 um, she was honoured with the 2020 Charles Richter Early Career Award um, for her research in earthquake rupture dynamics, among other things, um, using physics-based models. And another award she um, was got in 2020 again, so that's, that's another one in, you know, very recently, Alice, um, was the Price Ada Lovelace Award for High Performance Computing. So I think to get an award with the word Ada Lovelace in the title uh, says it all. So Alice, we are absolutely delighted that we've got you today, not to put you under pressure here at all. Um, as always, the Foltishar Learning Series really is about trying to help us all understand what's going on in topics which maybe relate to what we're doing in our research, but aren't exactly our own research. So it's giving us that introduction so that we can hopefully then better understand future talks and papers that we might read on the subject. Alice is very happy for people to interrupt. So if you do have questions as you go along, if there's anything you want more explanation of, please do, do ask her. She is the expert and it's your chance to really understand. So thank you again and thank you everyone joining us. And at this point, I hand over to you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. And I'm really happy to be here. Um, and it's actually not a bad idea to do that after the holiday because we're all hungry for research and for seminars. So um, I designed this talk today uh, to talk about um, physics-based earthquake modeling, so specifically about spontaneous dynamic rupture earthquake models using high-performance computing, but with a specific focus of how these kind of physics-based models could be used now and in future for seismic physics-based seismic hazard assessment. And Pierre, as Joanna said, please interrupt me anytime. Um, I would just speed up at the end if we're running out of time in case. So I start with a slide on computational seismology because this is where most of the methods are coming from that we're also using for doing um, our physics-based earthquake models. And uh, computational seismology has been a pioneering field for high performance computing and has been itself also been pioneered by HPC. And uh, computing has been useful for seismology to image Earth's interior, to understand the dynamics of the mantle, for example, track down energy resources. And it's been so widely successful and widely applicable because seismology um, can be often treated as a linear system. So the wave equation is a hyperbolic um, partial differential equation. And in the most simple, on the most um, applications, this can be treated as a linear system. And seismology is also data rich. And we are also in seismology following um, decades of open data sharing and model sharing. And the key activities that um, are the scope of computational seismology are calculation of synthetic seismograms in 3D Earth and solving um, seismic inverse problems. The common approach to do so is um, to look at the time domain solutions of how the seismic wave field propagates through Earth or other um, planets. And we are solving that by, um, in a computational sense, by domain decomposition. That means we are splitting up our problem into many small pieces and we distribute them across um, a cluster, a um, computational cluster, or many different um, processes that are running in parallel. There are ongoing challenges that link to 3D Earth structure, especially also to nonlinear 3D Earth structure to computational efficiency if you're going to higher and higher frequencies, trying to image smaller and smaller um, heterogeneities or structure, and the natural complexity of our geological subsurface, and uh, the need for open community solutions. I mentioned um, SPEC-FEM here as one of the um, lightning examples of uh, what a, a community solution can look like for computational seismology. However, um, you could state that the forward problem for seismic wave propagation is um, more or less solved. There's a very different picture if you're looking into earthquake seismology. Um, recent well-recorded earthquakes and also laboratory experiments reveal a striking variability of how earthquakes start, propagate, and arrest. 
we are seeing complexity such as slip reactivation. So here's a very um, prominent example of imaging of the Tohoku 2011 uh, mega trust earthquake, where we're seeing here in a kinematic source inversion. So we are inverting not for Earth's structure, but we're inverting for how slip propagates across the prescribed fault um, patch here. We're seeing re-rupturing of the same fault segment for three times here. And um, we can also use um, array techniques to directly image where high frequencies get uh, emanated during earthquake propagation. So this is such a back projection image of the Toku earthquake. And we're seeing this complexity of where um, high frequency bursts happen during the earthquake source process. We also know now that there's a, a variability of rupture styles, so earthquakes can propagate as pulses. So rupture front is followed by a healing front or as cracks. We have rupture cascading. The Kaikoura New Zealand earthquake is a prominent example or jumping from segment to segment connecting maybe faults that have previously been thought to be unconnected. We can have propagation of co-seismic slip along both locked and creeping fault sections even during the same earthquake. And um, we know about the um, interesting features and potential damage of super shear earthquakes or earthquakes that propagate faster than the S-wave speed of the surrounding materials, as for example, visualized nicely here in a plexiglass laboratory experiment. So <clears throat> giving um, that complexity, we could state uh, that the most useful things seismologists um, could do, uh, understand predict earthquakes is what they're least able to do. And I'm citing uh, Peter Shearer's uh, introduction to seismology here. We are now um, increasingly data rich in earthquake seismology. So here, is a machine learning based high resolution earthquake um, catalog revealing how complex fault structures were activated during the 2016 17 Central Italy sequence that has been just um, published this year. Um, machine learning enhanced seismic catalogs, but also increasingly high resolution space geodesy and um, seismic array techniques, and um, the rise of distributed acoustic sensing, as well as um, rotational seismology, for example, are from the observational side providing us um, a vast amount of data. Um, and in this data, we can see um, that data-driven imaging methods hint on very complex or on complex earthquake dynamics. So here is a visualization of a kinematic source inversion of the 2016 Norcia earthquake that suggests that um, two fault planes slip simultaneously. And I will get back to this uh, specific kinematic source model later on during the talk. We can integrate um, the increasing data-rich um, observations and imaging methods synergistically with multi-physics forward modeling that's empowered by high-performance computing. And this is where um, I will this is the, um, this idea is what I, what I focus my talk today upon. So how can we fuse observations and connect to uh, data-driven imaging methods with forward simulations that use high-performance computing? And uh, one of the examples I will show are dynamic rupture simulations. So that means we are looking into a numerical experiment where we do not know how a slip will evolve during the earthquake. Um, so that is part of the numerical experiment. And we're trying to understand if certain um, images of earthquakes are actually plausible in the physical or the mechanical sense, if, if everything that we know about how fault friction operates. And computational earthquake seismology um, typically requires multi-scale and multi-physics capabilities. And here are two um, recent examples I want to highlight. One is um, the CyberShake high performance computing platform that's designed for physics-based um, seismic hazard assessment by SCAC, so the Southern California Earthquake Center, um, extracting hazard curves and hazard maps from a large su uh, suite of um, physics-based um, earthquake simulations using kinematic sources. And here are examples from engineering seismology using the speed code um, by, <coughs> by the group in Milano. And uh, what's shown here is an application um, first to the seismic response of a bridge. And we can see that even um, like the structure of the bridge has been accounted into the computational model and um, the earthquake strong ground motions interacting uh, with the city of Canterbury in New Zealand. And um, this can uh, benefit from high performance computing. Uh, here's uh, another study that um, I want to highlight that this uh, supercomputing being used as um, uh, the Templar uh, plug posted here to create over 700,000 years of simulated earthquakes. So that's a study of Kevin Milner in 2021, where um, they've been combining um, the CyberShake platform with um, the user fault model, it's quite 
looks quite complicated here. Um, but what I, re what I like also about uh, from this paper is this um, overview plot that I post here. And this has in red what they proposed post in this study, so a new pathway from multi-cycle rupture simulations using RSQ sim. So that is a, an earthquake simulator um, that is quite well known and well used in the community, um, which has been initiated by um, Dietrich et al. And can be, this was linked directly to ground motion simulations using CyberShake here, and then to create synthetic seismograms that can be converted into intensity measures for, um, for PSHA purposes. We also show um, the traditional PSHA approach here on this plot. We can see that from earthquake rupture forecasts to empirical ground motion model based on um, the measured ground motions and certain distances to faults to intensity measures. And there's also a couple of other studies here that follow different paths throughout um, this kind of building blocks for physics-based seismic hazard assessment. And um, as a last overview figure of what the, um, we see in computational earthquake seismology, and to highlight studies that are really focusing on using the largest supercomputers around, um, on top here is a picture from a Japanese study that was combining simulation of ground motions and urban seismic response in uh, Tokyo using the K supercomputer. So that was um, the supercomputer was installed before Fukagu, which is now the fastest supercomputer worldwide, um, was published in the supercomputing conference in 2014. And a recent study by McGallan et al. in 2020 that were looking into um, a finite difference called SW4, which has been developed in the US by Lawrence Livermore National Labs. And here they're kind of highlighting recent advances in these kind of simulation tools um, we're having here semi-stochastic fault rupture models, topography, which can be incorporated by, by um, curvilinear transformation of the computational grid, the mesh here. And they're also looking into um, stochastically correlated geology and take this into account. And we also know that the HPC platforms are continuously advancing. Um, we can see this here uh, over the years, um, the high and the performance in this um, LINPAC benchmark, which is basically um, a standard way how to measure how um, fast a certain machine is. And uh, an important point is this one here, the exascale objective. And that is basically where computational science in the HPC world is currently walking towards to is to install these uh, um, next generation large machines that can reach an exascale um, performance or an exaflop in terms of how many computing operations you can perform per second. In the uh, cheese project, where I'm also um, 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 PI of, <coughs> we are trying to prepare specifically solid earth, so our community to be able to use these kind of large supercomputers and also to enable that these kind of simulations are being made useful for hazard applications. So at the moment we have 10 community flagship um, European codes in this project with different levels of technology readiness levels or different um, stages of advancement. Um, and how well they are already scaling or performing or usable on the um, supercomputers. And uh, what I just want to point out that we have four codes that are focusing on computational seismology here. So Spectrum, um, CISO, and ExaHype, which are um, developed and maintained by the Technical University of Munich and LMU, and Salvos, which is um, um, run by or maintained by um, an academic spin off company called Mondaik now. In cheese, um, I want to highlight the work of uh, postdoc Boli, and um, we were interested in um, connecting physics-based rupture models, and here I mean really dynamic rupture um, earthquake scenarios, to um, physics-based hazard assessment. And this is um, um, one of these flowcharts that Bo uh, prepared, how this could look like. So here we would look into um, earthquake scenarios that are built um, as spontaneous rupture models, so not kinematic rupture models, where we kind of stochastically prescribe um, slip and how earthquakes propagate, but based on um, friction laws, I explain it, that in a, in a bit a little bit more. And we can co combine this with other um, cheese flagship codes into intensity measures, these kind of sources, and we can combine it with rupture probabilities, um, for example, using um, Sheriff's, which is a code that's also been developed in the Fortuscha community. Um, and intensity measures and come up with physics-based hazard curves and maps. Here's also CyberShake, it's a part of the cheese project, we're porting it to different regions and we're using also OpenCrake um, to maybe come up with um, um, physics-based team PEs that could um, be directly complemented by modeling. <clears throat> 
And um, here is a recent overview um, of this porting of CyberShake to Southern Iceland. And that will be presented by Otilio Rojas of BSC at AGU this year. And um, as I said, CyberShake is a platform developed by SCAC and designed to undertake physics-based uh, PSHA um, from a large suite of earthquake simulations. And the idea is to replace GMPEs at local sites by an earthquake and wave propagation simulation method. And uh, we are relying here again on the nice uh, property of seismology that we are looking at linear systems so we can make use of reciprocity. And um, that means we, our simulations are scaling with the number of sites and not with the number of ruptures. And the computational workflow includes first um, to get um, a strain green tensor on the fault surface, and then to get our seismograms, synthetic seismograms by um, looking at the representation theorem and do a convolution of this green tensor with our rupture sources. And uh, this has been well established and um, shown to work really well in Southern California. But what we are um, working on is the first application of CyberShake outside of Southern California in South Iceland, and specifically in the South Iceland seismic zone, as I have said. And um, for this application, we've been looking into um, a couple of faults that um, are known to have produced um, historic earthquakes and quite interesting earthquakes also in this um, uh, bookshelf fault system here in, the, in South Iceland. So we have a um, sinistral east-west transfer motion that drives earthquakes here and all these faults are near vertical and um, parallel north-south dextral faults. And there have been doublet events, so earthquakes that were jumping from segment to segment and in general, it's an interesting region, not only um, also because of last year's, this year's events of um, relatively large seismicity and the volcanic eruption and so on. And um, we've been using uh, Craves Pitarka rupture generator. So this is one of these um, source models where um, we are prescribing how slip is distributed across the fault following some stochastic ideas and specific scaling relations that have been adapted for what we know about previous events in Iceland. And here's a comparison of CyberShake results to um, a recent um, empirical ground motion model of um, Milan Kosari et al, um, where we see quite a good agreement. Uh, the other application is um, led by Bo um, and will be, was presented at HU and is now in preparation. Here's um, an animation showing the difference in the source model. So this is a, these are dynamic rupture models that we're using. And we have been interested in doing this kind of um, dynamic rupture earthquake scenarios for varying degrees of complexity. What you see here is model A, model B, and model C. And we are now moved to North Iceland here, where we're interested in the Husavik Flatte fault zone, um, threatening the town of Husavik and other regions in North Iceland. And so what we're interested in is we're trying to understand which ingredients do we need in these kind of physics-based forward models um, to get um, a meaningful output for hazard assessment. And one of the questions we were wondering about is fault geometry. And the uh, animation here shows the most simple fault geometry where you can see um, rupture basically breaking um, through um, all of the segment here over this little geometric um, barrier, little geometric complexity. But we also looked into um, fault models that were really based on um, the available um, um, fault um, traces here that included up to 155 fault segments. And um, <clears throat> what we did to uh, come up with these models is that we've been exposing uh, these fault geometries to a tectonic regional background loading. So these are tectonically consistent scenarios. And uh, we've incorporating, for example, 3D um, velocity structure, bathymetry, topography, um, off fault damage, so not all of the um, earthquake energy is being released as slip on the fault, but some of that also goes into off-fault deformation of the whole struck and viscoelastic attenuation. And what's already interesting is that even on the um, complicated fault segments, we um, can produce spontaneous scenarios that match um, historic magnitudes. And uh, here is, is one of these um, scenarios, including the very complex geometry in red, who illustrated the faults that have been activated during the scenario. And uh, we see that we have dynamic and static stress transfer leading to cascading rupture across these multiple fault segments. And um, we also will see in the next slide that there's localized quite some strong ground motion that um, caused by this start and stopping of rupture and jumping at geometric complexities. And um, 
these tectonically consistent scenarios, which is exposing these fault geometries towards the tectonic loading, uh, match or come up with scenarios that match historic magnitude, specifically um, M.7 or M6.5, but we can also produce a variety of other uh, magnitudes. And um, here's a comp also again a comparison um, of the produced cart motions to this most recent um, GMM model. In blue are the synthetic data points. And we get in general quite good agreement um, with empirical GMMs. And while um, what's interesting is that while ground shaking varies significantly, um, we are seeing that the synthetic ground motion attenuation relationships are nearly um, identical. And we do see even some variability that changes with distance to the fault. And we have higher values in variability for unilateral and bilateral rupture to the directivity effects. Um, and we see also variability being higher on average than the typical standard variation values of GMM. And here are some of these um, shake maps in terms of spectral acceleration at one so second um, across and along the faults, heterogeneity here in different scenarios. And we also notice um, significant topography amplification in that. Um, period at least. <laughs> and we hope, sorry, just going back, we hope that um, that this shows that these kind of um, dynamic ruptures or fully physics-based scenarios are um, useful for complementing um, probabilistic seismic hazard assessment. So I've been talking a lot about dynamic and kinematic um, source descriptions. So I thought I'd bring up this um, this overview that um, <clears throat> that is kind of putting these um, these different kind of modeling capabilities of um, earthquakes of seismicity into perspective. So when I'm talking, when we're talking about dynamic rupture and dynamic simulations, um, we mean that rupture, so earthquake rupture um, evolves spontaneously and is not prescribed. And um, we also meaning that um, we do have um, inertia. So that means we do have waves propagating in these models. And we're typically looking only at one earthquake. So it's uh, in the seismic cycle, we're looking at a single event. The faults can be complex. Um, we have some proxies for off-fault deformation. I talked about it a, a little bit, but the faults are prescribed, so they do not evolve um, during this earthquake rupture. <clears throat> Whereas in kinematic simulation, we're prescribing rupture evolution. We also have waves, of course, this is the main, um, the main um, outcome of these kind of simulations. We're looking at a single event. Um, and here are a couple of other aspects. And what's also interesting is if you're looking into using um, supercomputing or physics-based modeling to go um, to advance a little bit in the seismic cycle and look at multiple earthquakes. Um, so this is where all of these models here that have been listed here, that are um, becoming more complex in, times of, in the terms of the equations resolving. They're typically restricted to 2D, for example, and have other simplifications um, and, uh, attached to them. So many of them, for example, um, do not account for um, seismic wave propagation, but include proxies like radiation damping to account for wave effects. So 3D dynamic rupture modeling um, is called physics-based because we're solving um, the spontaneous dynamic earthquake rupture as a nonlinear interaction of frictional failure and seismic wave propagation. And this is an example of an observation constraint 3D um, simulation using dynamic rupture um, model capabilities of the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake, connecting all of these segments in a, in a single earthquake. And earthquakes in this framework are treated as frictional shear failure of brittle solids under compression along pre-existing weak interfaces. And uh, we're typically using methods from computational seismology, as I mentioned in the beginning. And um, an important aspect to keep in mind is that these methods often have not been developed with, keeping, um, with the purpose of modeling like large offsets or um, large deformation that's been caused by um, earthquake sources. And um, when we're doing that, we have to um, somehow implement earthquake dynamic rupture as a source in these um, wave propagation solvers. And that is typically done in terms of, um, 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 for example, as a boundary condition in terms of contact and friction, or by splitting the nodes or the, um, the elements that are, that are hosting our um, earthquake source into two sides. And one of them um, can move, for example, if it's a strike slip fault, one of them can move um, inside the slide and one can move outside of the slide. And uh, important again, the dynamics during this process are not predetermined, but these really evolve 
as a consequence of the initial conditions in terms of loading and in terms of frictional resistance and the way the fault yields and slides, which is controlled by um, an assigned friction law. And the friction law relates shear and normal tractions to um, um, the ongoing slip or slip rate, depending on the friction law, um, to the resistance to this movement on these interfaces. And we typically uh, allowing no opening, so no uh, mode one kind of fracture uh, propagation, but pure shear motion. So there could be strike slip or dip slip motion. That means these fault surfaces have to stay in unilateral contact. And there are some interesting studies that go beyond this approach, um, specifically by the group of Pasha Bad, um, who are interested in what happens if you allow for fault opening, for example, at the, um, at the surface of, um, of uh, normal faults. But a typical assumption is this one. And this displ displacement discontinuity across the fault is um, what we call slip or the, um, displacement. And much of the complexity in these models lives in the definition of friction um, and the fault geometry and fault intersections um, and heterogeneities that could be other than geometric. So for example, in variations in the loading or under friction on parts of the fault. So as I said, this could be implemented by splitting the fault interface um, or as an internal boundary condition. Um, important is we're always solving the same um, equations that is the seismic wave equation. We just have different constitutive laws in the volume and at the surface. Um, there are some um, issues or tricks um, with these methods. Um, often you have uh, spurious oscillations that are caused um, um, at the fault, which have to be damped. So for example, in spectral element methods, you would include a thin layer of um, damping cells around the fault to um, damp out these very high frequency oscillations. And uh, DG methods, um, for example, carefully choose um, numerical fluxes. Um, I can get, go more into de this numerical details if you're interested in, you can just ask me. Well, most of the simulations I'm showing from our group today use um, SISOL, which um, is a discontinuous Galerkin modeling framework. And um, we have kind of um, um, a niche in this, um, in this game because we're really interested and we can um, very well account for complex geometries because our method um, discretizes ge the um, geological subsurface and topography via tetrahedral meshes. So that means we're using 3D triangles to match um, complex geometries, which is much easier than to fit um, um, a hexaeder into these kind of complex um, geometries. We can um, account for heterogeneous media. We're also interested, for example, in pore elasticity and anisotropy. And for multiphysics coupling, um, it's natural for a flux based formulation. We can nicely represent different physics on interfaces. We have um, higher order accuracy. So that means um, if we're refining our mesh size, um, we have um, a very rapid decrease of the numerical errors. And uh, it's also quite suitable for parallel computing and environments, this kind of method. And there's a couple of other groups that are using this continuous Galerkin for wave propagation problems I show here. One of the big challenges in the community is um, meshing or mesh generation. And um, <clears throat> this slide summarizes two community standards, the hexahedral meshes, as I just said, these are basically um, 3D um, rectangles that you're trying to um, fit into um, um, the model that you're trying to discretize spatially. And uh, that can consume um, a lot of manual labor to do so for complex geometries. And a common tool is, for example, um, trailers. Um, and the second community standard are unstructured tetrahedral meshes, which allows for automatized meshing um, and complex internal external boundary conditions. However, here we're facing numerical challenges. So we often can generate sliver elements. So these are elements which are, come extremely um, expensive computationally and have to be mitigated in other ways. And what we, the tools we use is a uh, GMesh. So that's an open source meshing tool or the modeler, which is um, free to use for academic users. And as a third part, um, uh, I want to, a third point, I want to highlight an emerging approach, and these are diffuse interface and curvilinear mesh approaches. So here the idea is that mm, the user of such a computational tool doesn't have to generate a mesh in the first place and doesn't have to deal with the, how to adhere the computational model to um, natural complexity, but um, that um, the com computer code itself is taking care of that. So without feature preserving meshing in the first place. And um, the plots I show here are both of these approaches. So at the bottom, 
what you've seen is a, um, is a diffuse interface approach, um, which also uses adaptive um, mesh refinements. So you can see here we have some, um, some cracks propagating and the mesh is um, adaptively refining to um, the tip of this propagation through this material here. And we've been recently using such approaches to better understand uh, mesoscopic um, off fault uh, shear cracks evolving during earthquake rupture. And on this side here, we see um, curvilinear meshes. So we've also seen that in the recent, pa uh, the recent paper I showed in the beginning um, from the San Diego group, where um, basically we're deforming our um, mesh to account for topography in a, in a curvilinear transformation step that is handled by the code itself. In we are scaling this dynamic rupture modeling approaches to uh, modeling actual earthquake events, just like the Kakoa event, um, we, we've been trying to integrate and also um, retrospectively help with the interpretation of a full range of observations. So we can account um, and scale or link these models to observations from seismology, geodesy, geology, tectonophysics, and hydrology. And um, we can connect that with what we know about the physics and using these large um, computational approaches. And we're also producing a large amount of synthetics that um, a really nice play field, for example, for new methods in data processing, machine learning, and so on. And this is um, the typical workflow here. So we're looking into what we know from geology, can be high resolution topography or bathymetry. Um, we are thinking about how um, the faults are loaded. So for example, we could assume um, only regional loading, um, where if these fault surfaces are exp exposed to, or we could think about stochastic differences in loading, um, we're looking into friction experiments to um, choose which kind of friction, how friction is evolving during fault slip. And we're combining that into our computational model. We're solving and we're getting um, synthetic observables that we can match or even use in an inverse approach um, with observations. Ground deformation could be, for example, also linked to tsunami modeling. And of course, into fundamental earthquake physics, what, what happens in these models um, while the earthquake breaks through uh, our fault systems. And um, <clears throat> this is um, a, a plot which is taken from a white paper that I can recommend if you're interested, um, a very extensive white paper called Modeling Earthquake Source Processes from Tectonic, Tectonics to Dynamic Rupture um, that um, I can post a link later in the chat by um, Nadia Lapusta et al. But um, <clears throat> I want to highlight a, a couple of current challenges. Um, so these earthquake source processes that we're trying to understand are ill-constrained, we don't have in-situ measurements and we're looking into laboratory measurements, we are facing um, scaling, or how to upscale these kind of um, data to uh, natural fault systems. And this is highly nonlinear, these are highly nonlinear processes, so quite different to um, um, a typical wave propagation problem. Uh, we have to, at the moment, <coughs> decide which physical processes are dominant and relevant at a given um, space time scale in real earthquakes and uh, think about if we can justify um, the computational or also the knowledge cost um, of their inclusion. And we have to think about uh, how to assimilate the knowledge we have and that we want to include in a suitable manner for software and hardware. For example, in the way um, we're discretizing the problem, which solvers we choose, which equations we solve, and how do we scale this on heterogeneous modern supercomputers, could be heterogeneous, um, keeping also energy concerns in mind. And um, another example of where we're trying to address these issues um, is a model of the 1992 Landers earthquake, uh, where we, I just want to show this um, to illustrate this idea of um, data fusion using forward modeling. So here the, um, we have um, scenarios of the Landers earthquake and we're constraining them with observational data from 1992 um, and community models and trying to better understand how um, the Landers event could connect all of these different fault systems. And um, this was a simulation that used um, a full supercomputer in 2014, uh, was a petaflop um, performance run. So that was um, kind of a, um, a record at that time. And um, I want to say that um, these kind of models and these multi-scales and multi-physics are now routinely feasible. So the same simulation costs now only a few thousands of few hours per very high resolution forward simulation. So here we were interested in modeling wave propagation up to 10 Hertz. Um, and um, um, yeah, what we've learned from this sorry, is um, 
uh, illustrated here. So this is one of the preferred scenarios of the actual event. We're seeing um, in colors here the slip rate, so the particle velocity in meters per second as the earthquake breaks um, using dynamic triggering or direct branching through um, the fault segment. And um, what we've been um, studying when we're performing these models is that the amplitude and the orientation of the tectonic um, stress tensor, which is loading our fault system and the friction fault strength and the fracture energy um, really constrain, especially rupture jumping from segment to segment. And the timing and the mechanical viability of this transferring is quite rather sensitive to fault geometry loading and strength. And we can also study um, the balance between um, rupture speed, slip, uh, things like a shallow slip deficit, including awkward plasticity, and enough stress drop to facilitate rupture transfer. Um, and one interesting synthetic output we're generating in these models is um, accumulated plastic deformation or plas maps of plastic strain. And uh, here's an outcome of this um, simulation and is compared here with a fault zone with compiled by uh, Chris Milner um, from aerial photographs. And we can see some nice um, agreements of this increase of offer deformation in geometrically complex fault regions. Um, so enhanced by geometric barriers, which are kind of hindering rupture transfers. We can match that um, qualitatively with fault zone with mapping. And um, <clears throat> we can also see if we're zooming into this part here that we have strain localization spontaneously forming during the earthquake, forming um, non-prescribed faults. So in this region here, we didn't have a prescribed fault in our model, um, but we do see co-seismic strain localization following um, the actual deformation that has been happening during the event. And um, one interesting aspect is that if you're including this kind of off wall deformation, um, the synthetic ground velocities that we're modeling has been quite reduced um, if in comparison to models that are purely elastic. And uh, here are just two examples of the same scenario, um, the preferred model, and the same one without off wall damage. We can see this 35% um, overall reduction if you're including for the damage that the fault zone takes. Yeah, and also quite some strong effects on the directivity of the event. And this is a comparison of um, synthetics and observations, which is quite nice given this is not an inversion. And the modeled um, PGVs um, with distance to the, to the epicenter um, also compared to observations. One idea that we followed um, recently for the Nordia earthquake, and there's a preprint um, led by Elisa Tinti, I link here, is that we can come up with whole families of dynamic rupture models, um, explaining the observations um, of a certain event um, and trying to better uh, understand also the variability within these, within, um, these kind of models. And um, the, we start our starting point is a kinematic model of the Nordia earthquake, which included two, um, two faults. And they had some interesting characteristics like nucleation in an area of almost zero slip, um, high slip patch few kilometers away from the hypercenter, then the activation of a misoriented secondary fault and rather large spatial heterogeneity in slip and also in rake. And this is the dynamic rupture model, in, which is resampling the kinematic model in terms of fault geometries. And we're interested in what are the physical reasons um, driving heterogeneous slip. Um, and is this multi fault source model with this difference in rake dynamically feasible? So we've been informing dynamic models directly from kinematic source inversion and test um, if it makes sense at all what has been imaged. And um, in the scope of doing so, we defined um, families of different dynamic rupture um, initial conditions that capture heterogeneity that has been observed in the rupture um, in different initial conditions. So here as homogeneous, I put um, a typical assumption where we're assuming um, uniformly depth dependent stress and strength. And um, we then started to vary that by assuming, for example, heterogeneous initial shear loading, heterogeneous initial shear loading and strength along the fault, or heterogeneous dynamic friction levels. So that would mean we have a, um, a heterogeneous dynamic stress drop during the earthquake, for, for example, geologic, um, due to geologically different uh, materials, which would have different frictional um, resistance during slip. Um, we've been coming up with ideas of how to implement that. I don't have really time to go into that, <clears throat> but the idea is that we're starting this, we're imposing the kinematic model and map it into different um, parameters that govern rupture dynamics um, and see um, 
which of these models would be uh, reproducing observations. Here's just one of these model uh, families. So that is the model with heterogeneous strength and heterogeneous loading. And um, you can see that um, the earthquake evolving is quite um, complex, but we do have activation of both faults and we do retrieve the kinematically imaged, um, sorry, slip distribution as well, <clears throat> which is kind of the, the end picture of the slip evolution here. Um, and especially interesting is um, this family that has um, a constant high static friction co um, coefficient, but um, allows for dynamic friction being heterogeneous. And this is interesting. So many of, the, many of these models reproduce observations almost equally well. And we didn't perform an, an actual ops, um, inversion here, which is more interested in um, the plausibility of these uh, assumptions. So the family C is interesting um, because we see that higher values um, of dynamic friction resistance um, are located in the area of small slip and may represent friction values of the seismogenic area and the central Apennines. And um, so we can account for this difference in slip at the hypercenter and this large slip patch evolving um, up dip by maybe accounting for the different, um, <clears throat> the different friction values that the local geology is um, informing us upon. And um, you can compare this to observations. I just put here a, a satisfactory fit um, of uh, one of these models with geodetic um, and strong ground motion observations. <clears throat> Uh, keep in mind that this is not an inversion. So this is a forward simulation informed by a kinematic model in terms of slip. Um, so this is the uh, one of these models and the synthetics and the observed data. And here we see um, the strong count motion comparison. And we also have an indistinguishable suite of models with vastly different dynamic and geological implications. Another example um, is a much smaller event, um, the 2017 Pohang induced earthquake where we've been using ensemble simulations to constrain computing views. So here, um, one of the observations was that the uh, moment tensor um, inversion showed this relatively large um, non-double coupled component. And the idea was, are there two um, fault segments that are rupturing together co-seismically, maybe explaining the specific um, observation, but also maybe explaining why this event was uh, magnitude 5.5 um, during um, fluid injection. And um, there's a paper uh, by Kadek Palgunadi in BSSA. But basically what we did is that we're coming up with 180 different um, dynamic rupture simulations varying the regional loading stress and varying um, um, the fluid pressure ratio. And we find, for example, that accounting for the regional loading stress um, is unable to generate uh, dynamic spontaneous rupture consistent with the observed fault faulting style. But we have to account for um, the change in the loading cause, um, caused by the fluid injection. We also see that we need overpressurized poor fluids, not as maybe not surprising, um, and close to critical loading stress to govern a data constraint scenario. And that with the simple model with two fault planes breaking dynamically, we can reproduce some parts of the strong CLVD component, but not everything. And uh, I said before, we didn't do um, and didn't solve an inverse problem. We can actually do that also with dynamic rupture models if you're counting, if you're assuming a simple forward model. And um, that is my my last topic that I want to introduce you to, and that is what's called dynamic earthquake inversion. So here the idea is that we're using, for example, strong ground motion data to invert for uh, to, yeah, to really properly run a, an inverse solve an inverse problem for these um, initial conditions. Um, so in distinction to kinematic earthquake inversion, there has been a um, few attempts so far to dynamically invert real earthquake observations. <clears throat> so the idea is to invert for the spatial distribution of initial stress, friction strength drop, and um, um, another friction law parameter that captures the fracture energy that is spent during rupture propagation. And we've been doing that for the 2016 um, Amatrice earthquake using simple forward models. So now we really have a single fault plane. Um, surface rupture is not um, accounted for. And we also start with a kinematic source model. And uh, we're using a Bayesian framework, using a uh, parallel tempering Monte Carlo Markov chain algorithm um, put up by uh, Malcolm Sambridge. And um, that is um, quite efficient. We still need um, around a million of forward models to um, 
solve one of these um, inverse problems in this uh, approach. And um, here's an illustration of the best fitting model of such a dynamic source inversion out of a million visited models um, in the frequency range up to one hertz. Uh, most stations were up to 0 0.5 hertz. Um, where we basically um, can reproduce a couple of interesting aspects such as uh, weak nucleation followed by bilateral slip pulses um, generated even with a very simple dynamic rupture model. And uh, we also see that we have a lot of heterogeneity being mapped into the fracture energy with this DC parameter here. Um, and we can also see that this kind of friction law of dynam dynam dynamics can help us to constrain the by design or inherently non-unique um, source images, kinematic source um, inversions. And um, we've been um, enhancing these models and we've been thinking about how we could use uh, an outcome of such a relatively low frequency inversion to think, uh, to think about um, broadband count motion modeling up to five hertz. And that's worked by uh, Taufik Raman, the PhD student at LMU Munich. And um, he's been taking this best or well, one of these uh, inverse um, outcome of the dynamic source inversions and enhanced it by uh, counting for um, fault roughness. So as you can see here, the fault is not planar anymore, but we have this fractal deviation from planarity and topography um, <clears throat> and um, trying to represent um, the high frequency um, part of the seismic radiation by enhancing um, the, simple, the simple outcome of the, um, of the inversion. And um, what we see is that um, indeed, we are accounting for this fault roughness. Um, we then have um, variability in, for example, uh, fault strength on smaller scales. That's what we see um, in solving the inverse problem and in strength excess. And um, <clears throat> what is very nice is that we can actually recover high frequency radiation by combining a small scale fault roughness and also heterogeneous um, DC um, as we show in these plots here. So here are um, velocity waveforms, um, acceleration, and the Fourier amplitude spectrum from selected receivers during the Amatrice earthquake. Black are observations. Uh, in red are uh, topic plots, uh, rough faults simulated um, mm, with Sisol, and then the planar fault is in gray. And we can see that um, we need. Um, this pushes the high frequency content of the simulations to match observations um, relatively nicely. In some st stations, we still have um, a lack of high frequency radiation, which we account to the fact that we're not including um, side effects, nonlinear side effects here. So we have a quite good match with real data in terms of realistic velocity and acceleration waveforms. Um, and maximum, we also see that if you're using this dynamic source models, we have some kind of a maximum source effect in the high frequency wave field. Whereas in kinematic models, we could also create too much high frequencies. And um, I had a couple of um, outlook slides here, but I think for the sake of time, I just skipped through. Um, we basically, I just wanted to add here that we're also interested in using supercomputing for seismic cycling modeling. And um, the nice aspect of that is to also um, open the third dimension and open to include um, fault geometry variations into um, fully dynamic, uh, <clears throat> hopefully models that combine um, the seismic cycle with fully dynamic earthquake um, rupture models as we've done for single scenarios. <clears throat> I skipped through all of this. So we have some time for discussion. <clears throat> Let me do this. So this is the summary slide. I just leave this up and I hope we have um, 10 minutes for discussion. Thank you so much, Alice. Uh, it was lovely to have that all explained through. Um, if anyone would like to ask a question, please just turn on your microphone and ask, or if you're in, able to, um, please do. You can write it in the chat as well and I can read out for you. If you're happy to turn on your video while asking questions, please do. Um, but if not, just turn on your mic. Hi, okay, I, see, I saw a lot of chats coming up, but I think this is all kind of, <laughs> okay. Hmm? May Sorry. I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Hi, Alice. Uh, thanks a lot for the very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I wanted to hear your thoughts on two different questions, maybe. 
about nonlinear considering nonlinearity in the near surface obviously lots uh, you have considered very complex nonlinearity on the fault and but uh, do you have any plans for the near surface type of nonlinearity the second question is that in the prospect of seismic hazard analysis what one of the views is that uh, you consider physics based ground motion estimation alongside empirical ground motion estimation in a logic tree approach where you assign the weight on the physics based estimation based on the validity of the uh, physics based simulation and then as we go by maybe in the next decade we, we would be able to lower the weight on the empirical and add those to the physics space this is actually the approach of cybershake uh, new zealand where in that platform uh, I, I was working uh, about two years in that project uh, they, the idea is to improve the physics space in order to lower the weight on the empirical and try to add physics space uh, weight if we are sure that the validity of the physics space is really something we can trust. I want to hear your thoughts on this. Yes, thanks. So um, first for the first question, um, nonlinear um, site response. So this is something we are interested in now in the SPIN project. So there's a new ITN um, where Heiner Eagle, especially the LMU is involved, and there is a very strong um, interest in new observational approaches or the rotational seismology, but also in um, nonlinear response. And this will be the, there will be one PhD student who will be looking at that at LMU Munich to include this. And um, we basically, our approach is to go back to the laboratory and um, ask for um, yeah, well-defined um, constitutive equations that would account for that and then to implement them. It's just something we, we haven't been doing so far. There are already um, simple, uh, kind of maybe not simplified, but there are working <laughs> of approaches how to include that, especially by uh, the work of Daniel Roten, who has showed that, uh, who has shown this works for Japanese earthquakes. I can maybe put the references in the, in the chat later if, if, if you don't know it, but um, yeah, there's already some ideas how to account for that. So that's a natural next step. Yeah, that mm -hmm. we should, we also see that that is certainly something we, we should in, include if, we're, if we want to use these uh, physics-based models for any kind of um, site hazard curve. Um, where, yeah, it would be interesting to compare that to empirical site um, correction factors. That's something would be interesting, not a Reddit. That this was done. <clears throat> um, for the second, for the second comment, that is really interesting. I should include. I should have really included the slide on the on the New Zealand cyber safe yeah. approach. Um, so yes, we this makes it makes a lot of sense to weigh these different um, to weigh these different inputs in terms of uh, ground motion prediction equations with different uh, factors. And I would think there's um, yeah, it would be interesting to really fine tune that because you know we have. In certain regions, we have different empirical data for different magnitudes or for different uh, fault distances. Um, one of the things that um, Bo finds in his simulations is that we, even though we do have quite a uh, variability in the synthetics in these um, in the models for the Husavik Flatte fault zone, um, all of these, well, most of these models are quite consistent um, <clears throat> when you compare scenario against scenario. Um, so if you would have like mm, different ge fault geometries or different kind of aspects. So there seems to be maybe really a nice complementary between these physics-based models and what we know from empirical uh, ground motion models. Yeah. Thanks. We have time for maybe just one more question if anyone wants to jump in. Um, Antonella, your hand is up. Would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you. So thanks for this comprehensive uh, presentation on different methods, which uh, as far as I can see, uh, describe mostly past events are aimed to better understand the processes at different scales. I'm wondering whether these models have any chance to be used in uh, anticipating the hazards. So to describe future shaking from future earthquakes and if there is any sample of validation of these models against independent data, not past reconstruction. 
Yes, thank you for this question. So this is exactly where I think these um, uh, physics-based or spontaneous dynamic rupture community is standing now. So we've been seeing um, emergence of these um, models that are explaining past events like the Landers earthquake, the Kakor earthquake, or on this past slide, uh, on this last slide here, have a model of the Ridgecrest earthquake sequence. Um, we've been doing that validating different or comparing to very different kind of observations. But um, what I tried to explain in the beginning, what we're trying to do now is really pushing or porting what we have learned on how these fault systems operate. For example, how um, which friction law is giving us um, um, good results, uh, the comparable with observations, um, how to use that specifically for, for PSHA, so for hazard assessment of future earthquakes. And for that approach, um, we do have to think about a specific fault system, right? So we are, for example, looking at the Husavik Plate fault zone, or we're looking um, at the whole Southern California fault system or fault zones like that. But then we can produce scenarios of physics-based spontaneous dynamic rupture models. And that what, that's what we've been doing in, in North, or Bo has been doing in North Iceland, is really to produce um, a whole suite of hundred, up to hundreds of models and trying to then um, fit into existent um, approaches at several plug-in points. So that could be extracting um, physics-based um, GMPEs and just um, trying to link um, these empirical versus synthetic current motion prediction equations that could also go um, all the way into producing um, hazard maps like CyberShake is doing. So that is exactly what, um, what we are um, kind of on the leap to do. So maybe I can add a, a comment with this. Probably these models are very, uh, that are very complex, complicated in terms of source and uh, structure for wave propagation. They do require uh, a very detailed knowledge of the source and of the medium where uh, the waves are propagating. So probably uh, it is more viable to consider more simple models and more simple structures so as to achieve some, let's say, predictive power as it was done for other methods, maybe one dimensional, two dimensional ones, which uh, allow simulation in a much faster way and therefore permit to, let's say, generate much more scenarios, maybe with larger uncertainties, but uh, less fitted to past events, so more predictive. That's, uh, right. yeah. that's yes, existing. Um... In, yeah, uh, of course, these are, yeah, this is complementary, of course, simple models, looking at the fundamentals or looking at, um, um, yeah, very um, simple and fast um, approximations, I, I see complementary to these uh, full complexity models, but there are certain aspects that we see are more and more, we see them now that we have increased observations, we see that um, ruptures tend to cascade, that we not have a single fault breaking, that we do have earthquake jumping that is beyond um, putting in a hard-coded number of five kilometers or seven kilometers into a hazard model. And to really understand those certain aspects, we do have to think 3D, I think, and we do have to um, think about earthquake physics and put this into, into these models. There are certain aspects which are not accessible by simple models. And I think there's a, there's a complementary approach that we, can, that we can have here. And on the aspect of the computational cost, so these large, um, supercomputing centers and the machines and the infrastructure is available specifically in Europe for European researchers. And it would be um, a big loss for the solid earth community if we didn't have the tools to make use of the infrastructure that is available. And we would leave that for um, other disciplines like life science or climate science. Yes, the point is uh, to find out which is the sufficient complexity yeah, exactly. to have predictability. <laughs> That's the point. That is true. That is so... exactly the point. <laughs> And this yes. is why, um, if I go back to this uh, to this model setup that we that we had here, why, for example, um, in both work, we're really um, thinking about like how much complexity do we need, for example, in terms of in terms of fault geometry, right? So that is yeah, that is that is the point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. There are two final questions. So, um, Alice, I don't know if you can answer these very quickly. Oh, yes. um, one is from Jan in the chat, which says you have the perfect tool to start testing empirical laws like size of logs to stop a rupture or specific gradients at the end of a rupture. Any work in this direction? And the other is Fanasis. I wonder if you could ask your question and then Alice can try and answer both in a speedy manner as possible. <laughs> Thank you. OK, hello. Hello. Hello, Alice Agnes. Very nice talk. Thanks a lot. Very, very inspiring. Um, um, I would uh, like to point out, for example, that 
if I understand, let's say, dynamic rupture in a single fault segment, okay, uh, that will convince me that there is a lot of potential than going to cascade rupture, etc. When you have big earthquakes like Aikura or Landra, etc. So there is some, uh, let's say, uh, skepticism when you um, uh, when people try try to model complex sort of a lot of ruptures, complex ruptures. Then starting from one rupture, then uh, clearing the the um, the field there, and so okay, I have this, for example, the the Elazig earthquake um, last year in uh, East Anatolia fault, when we have a lot of high HNSS data, there are a lot of um, a lot of stroke motion data. So there you could test your uh, dynamic rupture results with some uh, kinematic rupture models from GNSS, etc. So uh, do you think this is perhaps uh, an interesting approach, uh, starting from simple sort of one, one, uh, one fault uh, rupture? than going into cascading ones. Yeah. And another thing I would like to ask is that um, I noticed in your Central Italy studies that there are, there are at least there are at least three or four evaporitic layers that are involved in the middle crust or in the upper crust in, in, into the um, fault segment that ruptured. So there, clearly the fault surface goes through different mechanical properties because vaporites are quite ductile layers. Right. And if there is a thrust pile of three, four thrust sheets there that um, later were cut by uh, one single normal fold there, of course, your friction properties change. So this, this uh, ties with my previous question that if there is, let's say, an approach to um, make a physics-based model on a, one fold that uh, goes through different mechanical layers. I would like to see this approach uh, first, uh, which I think it's more beneficial. That's my comment and congratulations again. Thanks a lot. Thanks for that comment. Yeah, so then um, maybe to answer me, so the dynamic rupture community is coming from models, from modeling single single fault segments. And this is what, what the community is typically doing. And there has been a large uh, verification process, adding complexity by complexity to make sure we understand and all of the different methods are um, resolving that. And that's led by, by Ruth Harris at, um, at the USGS. Um, so the maybe one subjective comment is when you're modeling, for example, the Krakoa earthquake, um, adding this complexity actually helps us uh, to constrain the parameter space in terms of the initial conditions. There are not um, that many mechanically viable scenarios we can produce that balances realistic slip and realistic stress drop to be uh, able to trigger um, rupture jumping from segment to segment. So in that sense, um, in some or in these scenarios, adding more complexity is actually helping us to um, constrain initial conditions. It's actually, it's actually helping us to have less of a vast parameter space. If we are omitting um, complexity that is first order dominant and then based on our Group's work, fault geometry seems to be one of those. Um, it seems to be become, becomes very tricky to come come up with meaningful meaningful models. And then, in terms of simple models, for us, I think the the Norcia event is a simple model of just two, and also the Pohang event with just planar faults. And um, for these, we've been coming up with suits of models and trying to understand um, which of the variations and which of the um, heterogeneity is physically maybe meaningful. And this links to a second question, um, variations in geological structure that are governing, for example, um, the rupture energy balance and so are typically um, not accounted, I would say, in, in great detail. And for the Norcia event, we've been seeing that doing so is really has some very promising, or holds some promise for, for future understanding of why, for example, we see in the central Italy sequence, um, this row of energetically weak nucleations um, and then the up dip slip um, kind of accumulating. So yeah, there's certainly still um, more work to do to figure out which complexity is first order dominant. So which of those should we include even in simple models and which of them can be maybe mapped into proxies like the friction law, that's a proxy for physics that are going on. Yeah. Um, Jan's question, you have the perfect tool to start testing empirical laws like the size of jobs to stop a rupture, specific gradients at the end of rupture. Yes, so the perfect tool for doing that would be, I think, seismic cycling models that, we are, that we've been developing. I didn't have time to go into this, but I encourage you to check this um, EGO21 poster 
would be nice to um, enable sequence models that account for um, also the full dynamic rupture part um, and come up for, with 3D models with geometric complexity to do that. So with single earthquake scenarios, we could do so by feeding kind of what's left by one scenario into the next scenario, into the next scenario. But what we really should do is to resolve um, the seismic sequence um, to answer these questions. Alice, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> um, and thank you everyone for questions. Apologies, we need to, we need to close, but um, we've all learned a lot and I um, look forward to seeing you all at the next one. So thanks again, thank everyone. Thanks bye. for listening. <laughs> bye, see you soon, hopefully.